Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most interesting folks. And today we've definitely got one of them. We've got Gary Golden on the program. Thanks for coming today, Gary. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So I've heard you speak about the four Fs or the four futures before, and I wanted to jump straight to that before we go a little bit further out. Sure. Uh, so so in, in the world of, of uh, foresight, there's a framework called four futures. And what it essentially does is helps people think about archetypes of how the world might be different. So you take the future of a, of a company, an industry, a country, and you can imagine there are four archetypes, right? So one is just continuation. This is a, a world where, um, you know, the wind's blowing, you got your sails out wide and you just continue to grow. Things are good. Um, still do what you do today in the future. Then the, the, the second um, archetype is uh, a discipline constrained. This is where you look at the future and you say, we'll still likely do what we do today in five or 10 or 15 years, but there'll be stronger headwinds, right? More competition, more regulation, but fundamentally we're still the same organization. Um, then the third archetype is transformed. And, and this is where you go out and you look um, at your organization and you say, we're likely to do something completely different than what we do today. So either a new unit will emerge or the organization itself will fundamentally transform. Um, and then the final archetype is uh, decline collapse. And this is where you look at the world and you say, um, you know, this is how the world is going and we just don't have enough to turn the ship. And you, you enter this mindset of kind of managing the decline and you know, over a period of time, the organization essentially collapses. Um, so those are the models. And, and the framework was developed by uh, um, Jim Dater, who was a professor of future studies at the University of Hawaii. Um, and it's just a great way for organizations to think in terms of a range of plausible outcomes from their organization. Well, not just organizations. You can also go bigger picture. Well, how would you think about it in terms yeah. of bigger picture? Because I imagine there will be different aspects of each that apply to different parts of the economy. <laughs> but on the overall, how do you yeah. think about where we are from an economic perspective? What's up? What's down? Yeah. So it's, it, it, it certainly can be applied beyond the organization. So you could think in terms of a city, a state, a nation, uh, a community, a society, um, and anything that has um, any kind of system that has shared processes and desired outcomes can think about their future across this four future spectrum. Where do you think we are today in reference to that? <clears throat> we're, we're moving forward. Yeah. You could say the, the stats show that the world's getting much better than it's ever been, and yet we feel more divided than we've ever been. <clears throat> yeah. So I, I, you know, I tend to, um, I, I tend to, to lean towards the progress theory of social change. I, you know, I, I tend to believe that despite all of our problems in the world that exist today and all the problems that we know will exist and new problems that will emerge in the future, the world is getting better slowly. Like by, by you know, the most objective measures of just quality of life, violence, things of that nature, um, the world is getting better. Um, you know, the, the big exception there is likely to be our natural environment, but uh, you know, that, that, you know, um, that also could turn the corner at some point, but overall, I'd say the, uh, the sentiment of the world falling apart and we've never been so divided, um, doesn't really, um, align with the big picture. We've always been divided. We've always had tribes. <laughs> We've always had conflict between groups. Um, this is just our generation's turn. Do you think we need to get rid of, <laughs> well, what would you say is the driving factor of the, the separatism? Would you say it's social media? Would you say it's the advertising economy? Would you say it's something else entirely? Yeah, I, I think it's, part of it is just human nature and, and you know, social media certainly has an impact in its ability to amplify you know, more uh, closed community kind of tribe um, dynamics. Um, but overall, I think it's, um, it, it's something that is deep in the human psyche that we prefer to, um, uh, you know, associate ourselves with people that are like us. And uh, when we kind of cling to that small community mindset, you know, for better or worse, I think that's how most people in the world continue to exist today. And the exception, um, are, are individuals that are able to have a more 
um, you know, integrated, open uh, view of, of, a, of a global society. Which usually happens from education and travel. Yeah, education and travel. Is, is, <laughs> those, should that those, be something those, that's mandatory? <clears throat> I would say so. I mean, uh, overall, if, if, you know, if, if I had the, uh, you know, if I were king for a day, I think the, 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 the policy framework that I would generate would be to create a more civic culture in, in every society, right? I, I think we, when you think about the cycle of things, I think we are entering and need to enter a future where people uh, see the world um, as bigger than themselves. Um, and I think that may begin with a sense, it may require us to enforce kind of a sense of nation, a sense of, you know, kind of statehood, and then go beyond that, once you've experienced that, go beyond that to um, kind of a global shared experience. And, and absolutely education and travel are part of that. Um, and I am not someone that would shy away from a, you know, a mandatory civil service requirement. I think that in our time and place today, that could be an interesting public policy for more nations to explore. How do we avoid patriotism? Because it's, it's poisonous to our future. <clears throat> so, you know, there, there, there are poisonous aspects of patriotism. You know, there are poisonous aspects of nationalism. Um, but there are a lot of good things as well. It, you know, the idea of a nation is relatively new. You know, you, you could go back maybe 100, 150 years. 200 years, but it's relatively new for society. Um, and what it allowed to do, what it allowed people to do was move beyond hyper-localized senses of identity and community. So I don't think that patriotism itself is um, negative by default. I think that there are positive aspects of that collective identity that we can tap into and do our best to um, minimize the, the, the negative us versus them patriotism. What would you think about forced psychedelic experiences? I've heard from quite a few yeah. people that this is a great way to feel at one with, and, and this is completely <laughs> off topic, but thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, you know, one of the things that I am, uh, you know, sensing in the world is, you know, as we look, you know, we, we see this shift at, you know, in the United States and, and, and uh, Western Europe, we see this kind of, you know, movement towards, you know, decriminalizing, legalizing marijuana, and it's kind of opening up of a conversation around, um, you know, kind of recreational drugs. And the weakest signals that you're seeing now are related to the psychedelics and, 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 and mushrooms, right? So I, I do believe that... Um, for some individuals that are in the right state of mind and place in their life, that these types of experiences can absolutely open up their perspective to a greater sense of oneness in the universe. It's certainly not for everybody, um, but it is, it is funny you bring this up that I, that I feel like we could just be 10 or 15 years away from um, controlled psychedelic pharmaceuticals being widely accepted. Well, there seems to be no toxic. There seems to be no toxicity, and there are a lot of benefits in terms of. I, I personally haven't tried it, but very much would like to. But there yeah, seems to be just yeah. such an upside with very little downside. Just no money in it. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I think it really comes down to the individual, and and you know, certain individuals will have a capacity to you know have their mind blown apart, and other individuals just don't have that capacity. Um, but it, but it is it is fascinating, and and where you see the the conversation being led, uh, uh, Michael Pollan just had a book released not too long ago. Um, uh, John Hopkins uh, looking at kind of mushroom magic mushrooms being used for treatment uh, with individuals that P have PTSD. Um, I believe last month in in the fall of 2018, John a group from Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, made a recommendation to kind of reclassify um, mushrooms um, uh, into a more mild uh, uh, category for treatment. So you can absolutely see that type of conversation evolving in, in, in the next 10 years. Yeah, it helps people, especially on death row, if you know you're going to die, at least if you can accept it, that's, uh, that's <clears throat> something. That would be one of the more unfortunate, you know, places you'd have to apply it. But, you know, it's, uh, there, there are other people that are more trained that could speak to that better than myself. 
How do you think about creativity and innovation? Speaking of, microdosing yeah. is all the rage right now in Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, you know, beyond the microdosing for creativity and kind of focus, um, you know, obviously creativity, innovation um, continues to be an important part of the uh, economic human experience, right? In, in, in terms of, you know, work and, um, you know, our, you know, our, our kind of money-making aspects of life as well as our, you know, personal side. Um, and I still think we struggle as a, as a society to really like, you know, teach people how to be creative and think innovatively. Um, it is a very hard step for many people to take. So I, I don't think that we have figured out how to effectively cultivate creativity, foresight, and innovation in, in everyday people yet. Well, it's hard when the school system is designed to make a robot. We want to be able to insert someone Absolutely. into a factory. It's hard to, it's hard to undo that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I know you've talked a lot about robots and automation. I want to dive into there now. Is this the area you're most excited about when it comes to near, near future term tech? Um, you know, I, I'm excited about it. I, I think that there are certainly other things that, that are on my radar that, that are maybe higher level for me, but, um, you know, robotics and automation is, is something that is um, happening in our world. It is, uh, it is still many years away from being a mature uh, platform and strategy for truly disrupting the nature of work and, and industries, um, but it's happening. Um, where I try to focus on with my clients is helping them understand the bridge between this vision of like AI-driven work and automation and the service and knowledge sector and today, like what's the thing that we need to do to get from here to there? And as you know, one of the things that AI and automation needs to work effectively is, uh, is data, right? We need data sets to train AI to learn from you know, real world experience. So one of the shifts that I think is happening uh, inside our lives and particularly in the workplace is uh, the emergence of a new bucket of data, right? So we've gone through um, uh, uh, an era where we saw the creation of social data, social sentiment data. Um, then we went to the kind of health and wellness data, wearables, things of that nature, genomic data. Um, today we're seeing growth of uh, device and place data, so IoT. And I think the next wave of data is gonna come around our experiences. So I think that experience data what we do and how we do things is the next bucket that's going to grow in our society. Um, and there's a very specific specification that's happening in the world now of learning and in the world of learning and development. Um, the specification is called experience API. So what experience API allows us to do is record. I did this statements. So I read this article. I watched this video. I taught this class. I mentored with this person. Um, it can be very big picture experiences, or it can be very granular. Um, but this type of signal for me that we're going to begin capturing experiences um, could be the next step towards AI and automation inside the workplace. So I don't think we get to this future of automation and, and AI without capturing experience data in our lives in terms of how we learn and how we work. What would be some use cases for this experiential data? I'm trying to, trying to visualize it better. Yeah, so, so well, the, the, the shift um, is, you know, so, so 10, 15 years ago, we saw the emergence of our social graph, right? So a, a, a graph is like a mind map. It's a network model of structuring data as opposed to rows and columns. Graphs are um, nodes, which are circles. Those are people, place, things. And then the connection, the relationship between the other nodes. So Facebook is a social graph. Google is a link graph. Pinterest is, you know, a product graph. Um, but this social graph emerged over the past 10, 15 years. And uh, at that time, nobody wanted a social graph. Nobody knew what the social graph was. And now that data, that social graph data, is the most valuable digital asset in the world, right? 
So your social graphs are arguably the most valuable digital asset that you hold. And it basically shows who you are, how you're connected to people, what you like, what interests you share with other people, right? So think about the future moving from social graph to experience graph. If the social graph is the data of who you know and how you know people and your shared interests, your experience graph is going to be how you learn and how you perform. So the application of this experience data could be as an experience graph, right? So rather than getting someone a resume of kind of your chronological work history, you will actually show your work experience graph. So this is a tool, this is a software program or a process. These are all the things that I've done with this tool. So it's the actual embodiment of your workflow and processes, right? Interesting. Yeah. I would and, like and, you know, it, and it's hard to conceptualize, right? I mean, imagine in 2000 trying to explain the social graph. Yeah, you know, people be like, that one's a little easier though, because it's a family tree of your friends. So then think, uh, just think about it just in terms of tasks and learning. So think about um, someone that's trying to understand like blockchain. Well, mm -hmm. how do you understand blockchain, right? You watch videos, you follow people on Twitter, you write about it, you read about it. What are the things, the experiences you have connected to that node of blockchain, right? It's people, processes, steps that you've taken. I think the most effective application or, or creation of uh, an experience graph database would be something akin to a calendar. Wake up, mm -hmm. 6.30, brush teeth, 6.31, drink water, 6.33. <laughs> that would be yeah. Yeah, so a that, simple way. <laughs> like that's the, um, that's the like full power quantified self experience graph. Um, uh, I think that there will be some people that will want that, but most people may want more. Um, that's a little too creepy for some people. Some people may want it to be more like there are more walls. I don't want to capture when I brushed my teeth, but I do want to capture when I, um, watched a, a Ted talk or when I read a new book, whatever makes me look good, essentially. Yeah. And, and look, and there in this experience graph scenario, there will be people that are going to try to game it. They're going to be try to abuse it. Um, you know, it just like the social graph that will come with trade-offs. Um, but, but I do fundamentally believe that, um, this, these gr graph analytics circles and nodes and, and, and connected data, um, is how AI, uh, learns. So when you look at artificial intelligence, it is structured as a graph. Right? It's not structured as a row and column data store. So for me, you cannot get human beings to a, an AI-driven future without capturing experiences and capturing those experiences in a graph analytic data store. I think the smartest thing that Amazon or Google could do right now would be to just give away their devices, to give them to consumers, Google Home or Alexa, pop them in the homes because once you own that experience, you own so much more than that experience. If you have Alexa in your home, everything that you order through Alexa is going to be an Amazon basics product. Google could do very similar, but who yeah. owns that data? I, I see yeah. currently right now a world where Facebook just gave away the election. All of our data is being hacked almost daily and consumers maybe get upset about it for 30 seconds and then they go back to checking Facebook on their phones. Yeah. Yeah. We're, um, it's, uh, it's not good. <laughs> we, we are not in a uh, highly evolved, informed stage of uh, digital culture. And, and I think it's likely to get worse. Um, you know, this question of like who owns the data, who controls access to the data, um, privacy, all that stuff is likely to get worse before individuals and, and societies um, grow up and, and understand that they need to become more informed and assertive, um, in, in this age of, um, you know, data-driven experiences. 
So I, I think I think it's likely to get worse before it gets better. But over the long run, I think that we'll become more um, empowered and better able to control this this kind of data rich future. Maybe, but let's play devil's advocate. Yeah. Sure. Let's say, sure. let's say as the as the data gets better, the experience gets better. What are yeah. regulators going to say? Sorry, Amazon can't be a company anymore. Consumers are up in arms. I mean, you, you yeah. basically have politicians right now on their knees begging Bezos to bring a headquarters there. Sure, sure. And and it becomes you know the dystopian is um, the most powerful companies or organizations in the world aren't the wealthiest, but the ones with the most valuable data. Now, and they, they may also be the wealthiest, but um, you could also have companies that are, you know, by market cap, not as valuable as Amazon or Google, but uh, they have a lot of data about the population. And these are companies that you and I don't even know some of the names of. Um, so yeah, there's an absolute dystopia scenario here where um, individuals in society and elected officials just cannot keep pace with companies that understand the true value of data sets in um, shaping how societies function. So I'm, I'm happy to you know, play devil's advocate and not, not the utopian. Have you seen Wally? Uh, Amazon is that company by and large in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah, in many ways, right? They're, they're, certainly, they're certainly on the way. What, yeah. um, We've talked about, so we've talked about a little bit of the scary dystopia. What has you most excited these days? <clears throat> um, I'm very excited about uh, the world of energy is very exciting. Um, so, it, you know, we tend to be an information technology focused uh, kind of society these days, right? IT is, is incredibly important. Um, but we are we are transforming the world's uh, energy systems, right? And and just look by like sector, you know, energy and transportation are the two largest sectors in in the world. Um, and we are finally starting to see deeper uh, decarbonization of of the energy world. So I'm very excited. You know, I'm all about solar and wind and all those things. Um, but I, I am someone that believes deeply in uh, molecule fuels. I am someone that believes that you cannot decarbonize industry and transportation without having fuel. You need to have molecules. You can't do it with electrons and batteries. So Why? I'm very excited. Well, you just, um, you know, uh, you, you can't electrify steel manufacturing, cement manufacturing, heating, um, heavy transportation. You can't have battery powered um, uh, cargo ships uh, crossing uh, oceans, right? You can't have long haul trucks powered by batteries. There's too much weight. Um, 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 recharging times, you just, you just, you don't get the performance benefits that you find um, inside of uh, molecule fuels. I would say never say never. I imagine within the next 10 years, we'll have something very similar to Moore's law, but with the power function of batteries. If you look at the ability of a fusion reactor to have energy in, in almost infinitesimally small form, mm -hmm. I don't see why we couldn't have <coughs> energy storage with almost infinitesimally small size, able yeah. to have very large quantities of energy. Sure. So it, anything is possible, absolutely. Um, but th there are laws of physics. When you look at when you look at a battery, you basically contain within that battery, you know, the oxidant, the oxidizer, and 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 the stored energy, right? The whether it's lithium or something, right? You you contain both of those things. Um, the alternative to a battery um, is a fuel cell, which is a essentially a solid state power plant. And when you have a fuel cell, inside that fuel cell, you're combining the fuel and oxygen. So you will never be able to, and, and, and you, know, you said never say never, but laws of physics, right? When you look at basic battery chemistry, battery chemistry, not fusion or some crazy non-battery thing, you'll never be able to have, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, the oxygen side 
combined with with the the lithium and um compare to the fuel versus you know separate fuel versus the oxygen like you just because those things are separated and you'll always be able to have more fuel take the oxygen in from the air um there is there is a power density advantage to having a fuel system um batteries have their limitations they, they will certainly get better and cheaper but they have their limitations and when you think about like rapid charging supercharging that that um continuous that, charging well but continuous charging you'd have to have a power source right that places tremendous pressure on the structure of the battery material and it also becomes very difficult to manage your power grid right most people that are that are kind of um you know very battery centric um kind of solar post battery changes the world centric have no idea how the actual power grid functions, right? Like the cost of, 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 of meeting base load and peak demands and- um, Do you think um, the future is the grid though? I know right now, most yeah. third world countries are leapfrogging the overly expensive grid. Um, I, think, I think the future is, uh, is going to be a combination of, of, there will be some grids, right? The grids aren't gonna go away in places where they exist. Um, I think pipelines are gonna become increasingly important. Um, pipelines carry, you know, 10 times as much energy as, as an electrical wire. So a pipeline that has gas in it is both storage and transportation distribution of the energy. Um, and then I think we're going to enter a world of retail distribution of fuels. So imagine being in you know, a rural village in India and being able to go down to the corner and buy a fuel on a retail shelf that can power your home for a day, right? So retail-based distribution of energy would be a truly transformational model for the future. The whole solar on rooftop thing is a fantasy wrapped in an illusion of, of people that are in the suburbs, right? I, we have a house in Brooklyn, New York. We have solar. I have 17 solar panels on our roof, right? But that solution does not scale to um, mega cities, urban environments, and, you know, rural, rural settings, right? So distributed energy, I think the biggest, the biggest breakthrough could be retail shelf distribution of electricity. That would be the big disruptor. You sell it where you sell rice and, and other foods. I was in Thailand one time coming back on yeah. a motorbike. We ran out of fuel, so we had to stop at a, a grocery store and grab some liquor and pour it into the engine to keep going. Yeah. Retail exactly. distribution of energy. It, what, it would be big. What technology <laughs> are you most excited about these days? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm most excited about uh, fuel cells. I think that the world needs power plants. The world needs a new engine. Uh, we don't need a storage device. We need something that can be fueled and deliver energy. Um, the most versatile energy solution for the future is a fuel cell. It can, it can be used in trucks and boats and airplanes and rail. It can be shrunk down to the size of a phone. So you never have to plug in your phone anymore. You just refuel it. Fuel cells can be scaled up to the size of a shipping container and power schools and hospitals. Um, I do Rockets. not see, yeah, like solar plus battery being the scalable solution for the world. I, I think we need a revolution in a power plant model. Where do you see the most cutting edge work happening right now? In that space? Mm -hmm. Um, it's it, the, the most cutting edge uh, work is in it, it, the area is called power to gas, power to gas. So one of the things we have in the world is, um, uh, so we have all this wind and solar coming online. And because it's difficult to integrate all that energy into the, into the grids, you know, natural dynamic, we curtail a lot of that energy. So China wastes hundreds of millions of dollars a year in wind energy. The state of Texas curtails hundreds of millions of dollars each year of, of wind energy they can't use because it is electrons, because it's electricity. 
So power to gas is the idea of converting power, which is electricity, into gas, which is hydrogen. And you do that by converting water into hydrogen and oxygen using uh, electrolysis. And right now there is a falling cost curve in what are referred to as PEM electrolyzers. So PEM electrolyzers are now being um, scaled out into one megawatt, 10 megawatt, and 100 megawatt systems that are being placed like in the North, uh, Northern Europe. So you have the North Sea wind production. They want to grow that. They want to have gigawatts of wind in the North Sea. There's no way they can integrate that wind into the power grid. It'll just overwhelm it. So they're using power to gas to store that energy as hydrogen. And then when you've got that hydrogen, you can store it for seasons, so, and then just convert it back into electricity in a fuel cell onto the grid. You can take the hydrogen, you can put it into a steel plant and decarbonize the manufacturing of steel. You can put it into a natural gas line, decarbonize heating and natural gas systems or you can combine that hydrogen with carbon dioxide to create a range of fuels. So the most cutting edge electrochemical energy in the world right now is called power to gas. And when, when you have power to gas, you have no limits to clean tech, right? You have power to gas, you don't have to worry about integrating into the flow of electrons of a grid. Right, which is incredibly difficult because the grid use goes up and down. When you store that wind, solar, geothermal as a chemical fuel, you have a range of options. Right? So right now, Northern Europe is leading power to gas. Australia is starting to get into the game. Um, and th that's the most exciting thing that's out there for me. You know? Especially because if you're in an area with a lot of renewable, you can scale that up, sell off the extra. You got no, you, there's no limitation. If, if I want to have a 10 megawatt battery, I have a 10 megawatt battery system, and then I want to have 100 megawatts, I need 90 more megawatts of battery, <laughs> right? If I want to go from 10 megawatts to 100 megawatts of, of, of uh, hydrogen, I just need bigger tanks. I don't need the complex chemistry of a battery. I just need more tanks. Um, so think about like Iceland. Iceland could turn on the spigot of geothermal, right? Once you have, um, once you have hydrogen as a storage mechanism um, embraced by a global system, right? You've got the shipping and all that stuff. Um, you can literally just turn on the spigot of renewables and clean tech because you no longer have an energy storage problem. Why isn't this talked about more often? Well, in the United States, it's not talked about because we're dominated by, largely by um, Silicon Valley. Um, uh, the clean tech conversation is dominated by um, people in Southern California that um, like batteries. They think that fuel cells and hydrogen are a farce. They think it's, you know, they have all these reasons they hate it. Um, and they dominate the conversation in social media and kind of the main media world. Um, so it's an internal bias within the United States. In Europe, it's talked about a lot. It's a, a German utility and a German gas network just signed an agreement to basically combine gas and grid. Um, so in Europe, they're talking about it. In Asia, they're talking about it. But the United States tends to follow the, um, the lead of the most advanced kind of techno culture. And right now, people in California, they've got lots of sunshine and batteries are here and now. And it's just, uh, it's the holy grail for them. And I, I just, I think they're, they don't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> Personally. Elon, Elon, we're calling you out. Yeah. We need to get you on the podcast. I, I just, you know. It's just, uh, you, you can't, you can't, um, you can't, if you have a garage that you pull your, do you have a garage that you can park your, no, I live, I don't have a garage, go to China, 
those people don't have garages to park their cars in. You know, um, you're never going to recharge your transportation fleet, right? It's just, it's just not going to They're doing happen. really interesting stuff, actually, in China, making every single bus stop a, a supercharger. So the buses are ch charged just while dropping people on and off and then are able to continue continuously with battery power. But that's China. Yeah. Yeah, that and China does very different things, but I, I think that those are kind of uh, those those types of uh, technologies are. It's like the um, solar solar road. It's like it looks good, sounds creative, but just doesn't scale. You you can't. So you think when that bus pulls up, it may get seconds of a charge, right? And it, it need it needs it needs you know hours of a charge. Um, the grid is stressed when you, when you do that. So let's imagine every bus stop on a nine mile route is, is, has a supercharger at it. Imagine being the grid operator and seeing like these spikes every five minutes, you get this massive surge, um, on, on your uh, demand side. That's not going to scale. That doesn't okay. scale. Yeah, but you know, we can disagree on it. <laughs> yeah, I think buses, buses would stop at different times, so you wouldn't have as much of the surges, but I, yeah. I definitely see the point. Yeah. What, what problems are you most worried about going forward? Two or three big problems that yeah. either don't get talked about enough or you're most worried about? So I'm, I'm worried about, um, uh, I think we have uh, misled uh, a generation um, let, let's just, you know, let me, let me stop. I'm, I'm concerned that we don't understand the uh, challenges head around uh, demographics, right? We don't talk enough about um, aging populations, right? We don't talk about how much it's going to cost to have, um, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of baby boomers enter their, their 70s, 80s, and 90s. We don't talk about the costs associated with uh, you know, having a high quality of life um, in a generation that doesn't have the money to, to sustain that high quality of life. So I'm concerned about kind of the aging population demographic story. Um, do you want to talk about that one or? Yeah, we can, we can dive into that. Basically, yeah. people are supposed yeah. to die at 63 and we're living longer, so your social security is <laughs> yeah. screwed. Yeah. Um, I mean, just look at like like the 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 wealth of of uh, baby boomers. There are, there's a lot of wealth in that generation, but it, it's very skewed. The average baby boomer has like fifty thousand dollars in 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 total assets. Yeah, uh, you know, you you need a million at least to get you through, you know, your older years. Um, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to deal with um, this wave of aging boomers? The last baby boomer won't turn, won't turn 65 until 2029, right? So we haven't even started to see the impact in society. Um, and how do we deal with you know, dementia, Alzheimer's? How will you deal with a society that has tens of millions of um, individuals that just cognitively can't uh, function alone. These are enormous challenges that, that individuals and families cannot deal with on their own. So I think we're going to need to rewrite the social contract um, around aging populations. Which is funny because the aging populations are typically the most conservative and least likely to want to help out others. Yeah. <laughs> Ironic. Yeah. It's, it's too bad that it's too bad. We didn't know years ago what we know now about health. A lot of those disease oh. are, are caused yeah. by just bad recommendations when it comes to health. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good Lord. Yeah. So how do you keep the, you know, how do you keep boomers working longer? How do you keep them engaged? How do you, you know, like the autonomous vehicle people are like, we want a aging populations or our, that's our target group. Right. Um, so how do you kind of drive innovation towards, uh, aging populations then like go outside U S and Western Europe, um, uh, Japan, or excuse me, uh, China 
in the 2040s will age faster than any society ever on earth, right? There'll be more people in China over the age of 65 than there will be Americans. So, yeah. So See, see they're willing to work harder, though. So I, I, I think it would be <laughs> less of a problem. Also, we'll see what happens with health in terms of health and food. It's, 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 you have to have breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. You have to have breakthroughs. In, in There's the something future. like 8,000 8, uh, Chinese individuals a day dying from cancer currently. That's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. And, and that could be, the, the same with China has always been, uh, they need to get rich before they get old. And uh, they're not getting rich. They're not shifting to the consumer economy and they're getting old. So um, a wild card geopolitical scenario is that the aging of China leads to a civil war in China, right? That the aging population liabilities in China leads to a social meltdown. And, uh, and, and, and the worst case there could be kind of a breakup of China in the different regions. Which would be very- their, their, yeah. their aging populations are rural and urban. The urban cities are young, rural are old. And you know, we've seen how that plays out in other places. Yes. With, uh, with the baby boomers in the US, it's especially scary because all these kids are going <laughs> to college educations and have tons of debt and no jobs. Yep, yep. Any, so, other, any, other, any other big? Yeah, and then I think the other big one is, uh, I think we've, we've with, the, with the millennials, um, you know, I think we've, we've uh, kind of sent a message to them that you're digital natives and the world is being shaped by technology. And because you're digital natives, you're going to do well. And I think that that's a stretch. I think that they're great on like social media and some technology, but they, as a generation, haven't necessarily grasped um, a future where technology meets value systems that are different than their own, right? So we do not have a, uh, a good sense of how these different value systems around the world are going to respond to a high technology future, right? So nomadic, nomadic societies in uh, Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, rural communities in, in South Asia, right? How will um, different value systems in the world um, embrace and use high forms of technology is, is a, an area of great uncertainty for me, right? Well, it just depends if you're optimistic or pessimistic. If you're pessimistic, you get upset about it, which would be most of the Middle East. Yeah. If you're optimistic, then good things happen and you try to adopt it. Yeah, or it gets, it gets applied by from the top down. But we, we tend to think of, uh, I think in the Western world, we tend to think of technology as like empowering the individual and it's used from the bottom up and you have control. Whereas uh, some cultures and societies, it's top-down structure, and then it becomes a, a much more abusive uh, tool uh, in that world. So I, I'm concerned about our inability to understand um, you know, value systems and recognize that not everyone is in this like, you know, um, you know, big liberal world of, of individual rights and expression, et cetera. Like we're, we still have billions of people in the world that are operating in a pre-modern uh, kind of value system. And those value systems are very much clashing, a lot of it around religion. Absolutely. So that's a concern. Do you think as we become more technological, religion just starts to fade away? Um, no, no I, I think they'll, I think there will, we'll actually see over the next few decades, a rise in kind of religious associations globally, but we'll also see the kind of continued growth of, you know, secularism um, in uh, uh, countries and societies that have, you know, higher income and education, et cetera. I think that that, that, that trend that's, that's played itself out in the Western world will, will uh, be global as well. 
Yeah, once you have the internet, it's hard to it's hard to not have transparency. I wanna yeah. I wanna jump into a bit more AI now. I know you've thought about talked about a bit in terms of conscious computing, artificial general intelligence, and curious to get your thoughts on those. Well, talk to do a little bit more from your end. Do you think robot robots will ultimately become conscious, and will we be able to realize they are? Yeah. Um, so I, I I do believe that human beings are. Um, going to create the next um, leap in species and intelligence in the universe. You know, just like the bacteria led to us, I think we are going to lead to, um, um, you know, super intelligent AI um, that could be carbon-based, could be silicon-based, who knows? But um, I do believe that that, that super intelligent species is, is uh, inevitable. The timeline's always tough, right? I mean, you know, you listen to the Ray Kurzweil's of the world and, you know, it's... Uh, it's 20 it's years every story. time. Yeah, it's 20 years and, you know, he, but he's been pretty consistent with like kind of 2029 to 2035. I'll even go out to 2042. I'll still be around then, you know, barring I don't get hit by a bus. Um, I don't know that it'll happen that quickly. But I do think that by the end of this century, we will have um, this great discontinuity. I, I do think by the end of the century, which is in the, within the lifetime of my children, um, that we will have this emergence. And um, I don't know. I, you know th there are different ways. Again, like you said, whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, um, there's the whole line of like... Um, you know, the way we look at flowers and trees growing um, and we, you know, we appreciate them, but we don't really think too much about their experience. Um, and maybe these AI super intelligent things will look at us that way. Like, let's check in with the humans now. <laughs> and they're just off doing their own thing. Go to the zoo. They're off, right. They're off, they're off doing their own thing and uh, they don't pay much attention to us. Um, I don't think we'll get slaughtered. I don't think, I think it'll be a, I think it'll be a co-evolution scenario. Do you think consciousness is a function of intelligence or may we create um, AI that has no consciousness? So, yeah, this, this gets out of my pay grade um, because I, I still struggle to like, you know, define these things. Um, you know, I think there is an emergent aspect to consciousness and they will have something that is consciousness like, and it will exhibit all the things that we perceive to be conscious. I, I, I think it's going to be par par. The scary thing is yeah. either way, it will appear to us to be conscious. We it will appear. We yeah. um, anthropomorphize dogs, trees. Yeah. We'll do the yeah. same thing for robots. But what happens if we yeah. think <clears throat> robots are conscious and they in fact aren't, can they not be yeah. laborers? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's yeah. very it's very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. It gets super complicated <laughs> from the ethics standpoint. And uh but for us, like you said, I think we're just gonna default into thinking that they are conscious. And then we'll assign all those things to it, protections, etc. Won't that crash our economy though, if our economy is based on robotics? Um uh, you know, this, this is why you have, uh, you, this is why you have uh, lots of conversations now happening about universal basic income, about taxing the robots. Um, we will need to figure out how these super intelligent systems impact our, the nature of work and the nature of our economy uh, within a few decades. So we're gonna have to figure that out. I think it'll be highly legislated and regulated. Any predictions? Um, well, I think that the, the, that the, it's like autonomous, like autonomous vehicles. The future of autonomous vehicles for me is going to be a hyper-regulated, um, almost centralized future. And I think that AI is going to have um, significant restrictions and frameworks to contain it. So I, I, I think that AI will will emerge as an economic driver for society, but it's gonna have a lot of constraints, I think, required around it for any company that wants to introduce it. 
I would agree. I think it's challenging for the chimps to box in the human ultimately, unless you have yeah. a lot of sticks. So we will, have to, <laughs> we will have to see how that plays out. I know. Yeah. The problem I have, I can see definitely the, the danger side of the argument. The problem I have with people who are willing to say that there's no danger whatsoever is they're kind of like Mark Zuckerberg. They're just mm. completely ignorant and assume mm. everything is good because when we connect everyone online, then everyone's going to be happy and sing kumbaya, right? And yeah, we'll, uh, so, yeah, we'll have to see, <laughs> have to see about that. What, uh, yeah. what got you into this field? How'd you become a futurist? Um, so I, um, as a, as, as a, as a child, I had always been interested in social change, right? I was always like, why, what is happening in this world? And one of the things was, uh, I had a, a paper route when I was, you know, 10 or 11 or something. And then at some point, a friend, I gave up the paper route and my friend came in maybe a week or two later and said, Oh, my mother has your paper route. And she's got five other paper routes, and that's what she does for a living. And our members are really young, you know, teenager thinking, wow, like, why is an adult doing this child's job? And I started to think about the social change around the nature of work. Um, and then I went, I lived in Nepal and India for two years, always been interested in social change, like how does society change? And then at some point, I became obsessed with space tourism. That was like the thing that brought me in. And I, you know, colonizing Mars. And I went to the Mars Society Conference in Toronto. And I saw the word futurist. Like, maybe there was a futurist speaking. Or I saw it in a brochure. And I went and I searched futurist and saw the program at the University of Houston. And uh, several years later, in 2003, went to the University of Houston Future Studies program, um, graduated, and then I was in the field. So, so it was kind of a, an, an, a lifelong interest in social change, a realization that there are practicing futurists that have clients, um, and then the University of Houston program is what um, gave me the opportunity to bring those two things together. Were you a nerd growing up? Were there a sci-fi author or book that really motivated you or helped you think outside the box? This, this, is my, this is the thing that always shocks people. I never read science fiction. Like I, I, I read the Foundation series only so I could talk about it with the other futurists, but I never watched Star Trek. I never, I, I never had that sci-fi bug. Um, it's always been more about social, social change you know, I was reading books like Salt, Cod, like social histories of things. Um, more that than like sci-fi. I found the Foundation series. The, the books are a little bit slow. If you could cut like 30% yeah. out of the book, it would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, I've got some good ones. I've, you know, um, Diamond Age, I'm revisiting that. Um, I love sci-fi, you know, as, as, as a genre in the world. Um, it just hasn't uh, been central to me becoming a futurist. What'd you learn, what'd you learn from traveling and living in India and Nepal? I imagine that was a bit transformational. Uh, it was definitely transformational. So I, I went there kicking and screaming, hating Western civilization. And I got there and I was like, wow, there's a lot of amazing things in, in uh, kind of this Hindu, Buddhist, South Asian monsoonal culture. Um, and there are a lot of terrible things about this, <laughs> this culture. So it, it was kind of my young 20s um, awakening that uh, people are the same everywhere you go. They've got a beautiful side and a terrible side. Um, and, uh, you know, the way we do it in the West isn't so bad. So it was kind of a, an awakening and an acceptance for me. Um, and, and, you know, I do definitely, uh, you know, I went, was there for a year, went back for another year. I do definitely have a uh, natural leaning toward the Hindu concept of the universe and big cycles and, you know, regurgitation of the same stories, you know, that, that poetically, um, uh, sings to me right the the kind of hindu hindu construct of the story and the unfolding of the universe feels closest 
to the modern day scientific understanding of the universe. Well, we don't know what so, happened before the Big Bang. It's like you're playing the video game and shit, you yeah. got to take it out and you put it back in. Reset. But these, yeah, but the Hindus are just like, whatever happened, it happened a million times before. Like they're just, it's mm -hmm. like the turtles all the way down line, right? Yeah. <laughs> I got to say, I like Buddhism personally because it's the least religious and the least Absolutely. violent. Absolutely. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. um, from a, from a, uh, um, it's a way of life, not a religion. Yeah, it's a way of life. Like Hinduism is just kind of a, it's a very socially constructed and associated view. Um, you know, who's got it right? You know, the Buddhists have got it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. suffering is what suffering you make yeah. of it, more or less. Absolutely. I, 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 have, I have a similar hanging, the uh, uh, painting in the background in mm -hmm. South Asia. Do you meditate? No, so I, I have young kids and I should meditate, but um, they keep me so distracted and busy that I haven't been able to overcome the, uh, the realities of everyday life to, to really develop that practice. Um, I have a longing to meditate and probably a need to do it, um, but it's not a current practice. There's a saying as something to the effect of, if you don't have time to meditate for two minutes, you should meditate for 20. Yeah. So that, mm -hmm. I'm all about that. Very, very beneficial. What, uh, yeah. if you had to leave people with something, a quote, a call to action, et cetera, what would it be and why? Uh, so there is a, um, there, there was a, a line delivered by Yo-Yo Ma, who's a, a famous cellist musician. Uh, he was, a, he was at the, uh, Kennedy Center Awards, he was receiving one of their esteemed awards. And he said, basically, you know, you get through his speech and he said, every day I wake up and move toward the things I don't understand. Every day I wake up and move toward the things I don't understand. And that's kind of the, that's why I'm a futurist. For me, that, that desire to move toward uncertainty, toward the things that we don't understand, is the essence of futurist thinking. Um, so that's kind of my call to action for people is to wake up and go toward the things that you don't understand. When you stop learning, you start dying. I have one last question for you and that's outside of what we've talked about today. I want a bold contrarian prediction with a timeline. It's perfectly fine to be wrong. And I know everyone hates doing it, but it's yeah. the that goes into it that makes it valuable. Give me the theme. Anything you like. Um, so I would say we will be a um, fully carbon neutral society by 2060. We better hope so. We got a, we got a race on our hands. <laughs> we're, uh, we're bailing water out of the ship and trying to make it to port like Jack Sparrow. Yeah. It's not pretty. <laughs> it's not pretty, but if we all do something, then we can, we can change the world enough. Gary, where's the best place for people to find you, learn a little bit more about you and what you do? Sure. So well, the big thing is that I have two R's in my name, um, GaryGolden.com and Gary Golden on t Twitter is the place that I live most uh, in terms of my thinking. Um, so at Gary Golden um, for kind of all social media. Um, and then I'm, I'm also a... Um, I'm a big user of uh, Digo, which is a social bookmarking site. So you're online, you see an article or video, you tag it into this, into a cloud-based bookmarking service. So if you search Digo, D-I-I-G-O, um, Gary Golden, you can see all the signals of change that I've tagged across a range of things. People still use those bookmarking sites? Yes. That was you like the beginning the, of the internet. I know. That was, that was the early web 2.0. Remember Delicious? Delicious. Yeah. Dig. The, the bookmarklet. There were a lot of yeah. them. Yeah. But, but Digo is still going strong. And, and I do it because I think that when like, you know, individuals, you know, when can you get like your IBM Watson? When can you get your intelligent assistant? I believe that my Digo account will bring my AI assistant up to speed better than anything else that you could have. Mm -hmm. So I, I take photos all the time 
because I know that the AI is going to want to see a visual representation of my life and I tag everything. That would be great. So if we can, if we can grow a body or put a face on someone, we can kill you, replace you, and it knows exactly how to be you. Go on. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Tom Cruise style. Gary, thanks. Thanks for coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Talk if you, you guys soon. have enjoyed this, check out Gary, check out the podcast. You can find me as well on Twitter at Matt Ward IO. It's a little bit harder when you don't have a unique name. Thanks, Gary. Thank you.